Mrs. McMillan. By the way, notice some of these pictures in your textbook that are actual images of what happens in tests when atomic weapons hits a house. That's in photo, that's exactly what it looks like when total destruction happens. Notice the house asks uh, Mrs. McMillan, would you like a poem as you get ready to go to bed? Of course, Mrs. McMillan is a silhouette on the outside of the house, along with her two children and her husband, yes? So she can't answer. So the house will say, fine, I'll play one of your favorites. By the way, this is before, for example, today we have Siri and Alexa. That is to say, technology where you can say to it, please play whatever and it will do it for you. This story was written long before that. That's why many people say Bradbury is kind of like prophetic. He saw coming this kind of technology where technology does everything for us. So the house picks its own poem. The poem, of course, will, un will understand now the title of the text is There Will Come Soft Rains, which is a famous poem written by Sarah Teasdale, who in her poem says, After the war, there will come soft rains, the smell of the ground, swallows circling, shimmering sound, frogs in the pool singing at night, wild plum trees and tremulous white. In other words, all the animals are still going to survive a, a war. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire, and not one of the animals will know of the war. Not one will care at last when it's done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And then the top of 290. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. Teasdale's poem suggesting that humans, while we like to think of ourselves as central to this whole story that we call the earth, that in fact, uh, war is going to annihilate all of us and the animals will still keep going. Of course, what's significant? Write this down at level 3A. What is significant about a poem like this being set right in the middle of the story? Teasdale's poem, of course, is recited by the house. And of course, the events that this poem is suggesting are actually being played out in this story. The dog shows up, he goes through the house howling, starving, looking for some people. There's nobody there. Of course, we can already jot down at 3A all of the titles that come to mind for you of this kind of ap apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic story, right? Book of Eli comes to mind. I Am Legend comes to mind. Those of you who know the Matrix stories or the Terminator stories come to mind. What are the other stories or movies? Hey, can I say this out loud? This story had a tremendous effect in the gaming industry. How many games do you play where the world has somehow been destroyed because of some foolishness, that is to say some kind of atomic bombs or whatever, and now humans have to somehow exist. If you play video games with cyborgs and all that kind of stuff, all of that is predicated on a story like this. At 10 o'clock, the house. Look at it. At 10 o'clock, the house began to die. It's the end of the story. The wind blew. A falling tree bough crashed through the kitchen window. Cleaning solvent, bottled, shattered over the stove. The room was ablaze in an instant. Fire! Fire! screamed a voice. The house lights flashed. Water pumps shot water from the ceilings. But the solvent spread on the linoleum, licking, eating, under the kitchen door, while the voices took it up in chorus. Fire! 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 The house tried to save itself. Doors sprang tightly shut, but the windows were broken by the heat, and the wind blew and sucked upon the fire. The house gave ground as the fire in ten billion angry sparks moved with flaming ease from room to room, and then up the stairs. While scurrying water rats squeaked from the walls, pistoled their water, and ran for more and the wall sprays let down showers of mechanical rain. But too late. Somewhere, sighing, a pump shrugged to a stop. The quenching rain ceased. The reserve water supply, which had filled baths and washed dishes for many quiet days, was gone. The fire crackled up the stairs. It fed upon Picassos and Matisses in the upper halls. Famous paintings. The delicacies, baking off the oily flesh, tenderly crisping the canvases into black shavings. Now the fire lay in beds, stood in windows, changed the colors of drapes. And then, 
reinforcements. From attic trap doors, blind robot faces peered down with faucet mouths gushing green chemical. The fire backed off, as even an elephant must at the sight of a dead snake. Now there were twenty snakes whipping over the floor, killing the fire with a clear, cold venom of green froth. But the fire was clever. It had sent flame outside the house, up through the attic to the pumps there. An explosion. The attic brain which directed the pumps was shattered into bronze shrapnel on the beams. 291. The fire rushed back into every closet and felt of the clothes hung there. The house shuddered, oak bone on bone, its bared skeleton cringing from the heat, its wire, its nerves revealed as if a surgeon had torn the skin off to let the red veins and capillaries quiver in the scalded air. Help! Help! Fire! Run! Run! Heat snapped mirrors like the first brittle winter ice, and the voices wailed, Fire! Fire! Run! Run! Like a tragic nursery rhyme. A dozen voices, high, low, like children dying in a forest, alone, alone. And the voices fading as the wires popped their sheathings like hot chestnuts. One, two, three, four, five voices died. In the nursery, the jungle burned. Blue lions roared. Purple giraffes bounded off. The panthers ran in circles, changing color, and ten million animals running before the fire vanished off toward a distant, steaming river. Ten more voices died. In the last instant under the fire avalanche, other choruses, oblivious, could be heard announcing the time, playing music, cutting the lawn by remote control mower, or setting an umbrella frantically out and in the slamming and opening front door. A thousand things happening, like a clock shop when each clock strikes the hour insanely before or after the other, a scene of maniac confusion, yet unity, singing, screaming, a few last cleaning mice darting bravely out to carry the horrid ashes away. And one voice, with sublime disregard for the situation, read poetry aloud in the fiery study until all the film spools burned, until all the wires withered and the circuits cracked. The fire burst the house and let it slam flat down, puffing out skirts of spark and smoke. In the kitchen, an instant before the rain of fire and timber, the stove could be seen making breakfasts at a psychopathic rate. Ten dozen eggs, six loaves of toast, twenty dozen bacon strips, which, eaten by fire, started the stove working again, hysterically hissing. The crash. The attic smashing into kitchen and parlor. The parlor into cellar, cellar into sub-cellar. Deep freeze, armchair, film tapes, circuits, beds, and all, like skeletons, thrown in a cluttered mound deep under. Smoke and silence. A great quantity of smoke. Dawn showed faintly in the east. Among the ruins, one wall stood alone. Within the wall, a last voice said over and over, again and again, even as the sun rose to shine upon the heaped rubble and steam. Today is August 5th, 2026. Today is August 5th, 2026. Today is... One I've had students that say, okay, dude, of all the stuff I've read in high school, without question, this is the text that really gives me pause. Let's just begin at the end. How does the story end with that ellipsis after today is dot, dot, dot? Jot down in your notes the power of this final line in this story. Now, I told you, this was a story where Bradbury, by the way, we can put it at 3A, the great author of Fahrenheit 451. If you are not yet familiar with that novel, you want to take a look at that one. An amazing text as well. Bradbury so gifted in his ability to say something without actually saying it. Because really, if you summarize at level one, this is really nothing more than a story about a house that burns down. Am I right? I mean, really, think about it. All this story is about, if somebody were to ask you, dude, what's the story, there will come soft rains, what's it about? You would say, well, level one, it really is just about a house 
that is fully automated and intelligent. Can we call it a smart house? As today, of course, some are beginning to call these homes smart houses following the idea of a smartphone. In other words, fully automated. Everything is done for you. You walk into a room, you tell it to turn on the lights, or it does it for you automatically. Or you can, of course, tell it to turn on music or to turn on the TV or whatever. Fully automated. This is really a story that begins at the beginning of the day, and by the end of the day, the house is burned down. That's literally all that's going on here. But there's something else going on, right, that makes this such an important story for us in the history of critical fog, especially after the dropping of atomic weapons. I actually want to go back, though, really quickly to page 287. Go there with me real fast. Right in the middle of the page, the house was an altar with 10,000 attendants, big, small, servicing attending inquires. Notice the religious language that's being used here by Bradbury about this house. But the gods had gone away. The humans that had been intelligent enough to create this technology that was this smart house, they were now gone. There are no more humans left in the world. Where are all the humans? How does the story Notice to finish, the gods had all gone away, and the ritual of the religion continued senselessly, endlessly. That is to say, this is a story at 2A that says what? What is the major message or theme of this story? What is it for you? Many students will report, this story really says, it's a warning, isn't it? It's a propedeutic, let's use that word, didactic, it's instructional, it's saying what to humans? We have to be careful. We have to pay attention. Because if we decide as a species that we are going to resolve our conflicts through the use of weapons of mass destruction, it may be the case that Sarah Teasdale's poem becomes actually fulfilled. And that in fact, nobody will care when humankind is utterly destroyed and the animal world will just go on doing what it does. To be, obviously, we could ask about setting. Why is this story so important in regards to setting? Well, everything is about the house, of course. The setting of the house is obviously central to our reading of the story. I want to, I want to ask this, though. What about fire as a symbol? Notice the personification of the fire, right? When we begin to give uh, um, uh, inanimate objects human kinds of personification on page 290. The fire, we're told, is very clever. Of course, what's significant about fire? Well, of course, this is what usually happens when you have explosions, weapons of, of mass destruction exploding as fire, right? Notice the failure of technology, the personification of fire ending with the, word, with the words an explosion, exclamation point on page 290. The house then is personified. Look at it on 291. The house shuttered, oak bone on bone, bared skeleton, cringing from the heat, its wire, its nerves revealed, and then an interesting set of similes here. As if a surgeon had torn the skin off to let the red veins and capillaries quiver in the scalded air. And then the house starts speaking out loud, right? Help, 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 uh, fire, run, run. In other words, trying to save humans. Of course, there are no humans left to be saved anymore. Notice a couple of lines later, like children dying in a forest alone. And then one, two, three, four, five voices died. Of course, these are the voices of the house, but we immediately think of the five human beings who are silhouetted on the outside of the house. At the moment of the last explosion, their bodies were silhouetted against the house as they were exterminated. Notice a few lines later at the very bottom of 291, a thousand things happened like a clock shop when each clock strikes the hour insanely. For those of you that know the band Pink Floyd, who made a famous album called Dark Side of the Moon. They actually played with this notion where at one moment in the album, they have a whole bunch of alarm clocks go off at the same time, but they are different, it, it, they're different tonal sounds playing the exact same game. Like a whole bunch of clocks going off in a clock. In other words, we're counting down. We're counting down throughout this entire story, which is to say in 1950, the word was simply, be careful. What's the primary symbol of a story like this then for you? Is it the house? Is it fire? Is it those images silhouetted on the outside of the house who were not at all prepared for the moment of their death? Is it Teasdale's poem, namely the idea that the animals that remain are all that remain? Nature will go on 
after humans had exterminated themselves. At 3A, we've already mentioned a number of titles. In fact, it's quite fascinating. Students will often say, man, if I think about it, the majority of the texts that I'm most attracted to kind of have this futuristic, uh-oh, bad things are coming game getting played. For those of you that know Ayn Rand's classic little novel, Anthem, we're playing the same game again. A future world where, for some reason or another, humans mindlessly made decisions to resolve conflict by blowing themselves up. By the way, at 3A, put this in your notes. When you're a senior, we will study together Golding's classic, Lord of Flies. We'll play the exact same game there. Golding was, like Bradbury, deeply concerned, as were many, many artists, by the way, deeply concerned about what technologies would mean going forward. Who started all of this? You could argue at 3A that it's a woman named Mary Shelley who wrote a famous novel called Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. We'll study that one as well when we're seniors, so put that one in your, in your uh, notes to look forward to. Finally, at 3B, what do you do with a story like this? It is somewhat horrifying to read a story like this that's set, written in 1950, set only just a few years in front of the time that you're alive. To what degree is a story like this still a powerful suggestion? Reminder, we said propedeutic. To what degree do you think we still have to worry about these kinds of issues going forward. Finally, do you think that humankind, once it does exterminate itself, that humankind will be surpassed again by the world of nature? And that in fact the world of nature will keep going on anyway? Well, a disturbing, no question, a disturbing prophetic text written long ago and still I think has some meaning for us today. Thank you, I hope it challenged you.